In this example problem, we're going to determine the specified influence lines and force effects for the below structures using the Mueller-Breslau principle. We're going to look at a simply supported beam and first look at the reaction at support A. Then we'll look at the shear at point C. And then we'll look at the moment at point C. And we have a few different loading configurations, as you can see. First. I give a, a few details on the background of the Mueller-Breslau principle. So the Mueller-Breslau principle states that the influence line for a force effect, say a reaction shear or moment, is to the same scale as the deflected shape of the beam when the beam is acted upon by the given force effect. To determine the deformed shape, we need to release the structure's ability to resist the, the particular force effect at the point of interest. So as an example, if we wanted an influence line for the moment at a point, let's say point C, we need to release the moment restraint. In other words, add a pin at point C and then apply the moment back to the structure. So this deformed shape here would be our influence line for the moment at C for this simply supported beam. If we're looking for the reaction at a point, say the reaction at point A, then we need to release that reaction and displace the structure one unit uh, upward, in, so in the direction of the reaction. So here we're displacing the structure one unit up, and then we have a straight line for our influence line. So using that, we can calculate the reaction uh, at point A due to the load shown here. We can do the same thing with the moment. So as I showed on the previous slide, we can release the moment restraint. So adding a, adding a hinge and then applying that moment back to cause the displaced structure. So adding a hinge and adding the moment back and displacing the structure. For shear, we want to add what's called a sticky roller. And this roller allows for vertical displacement while keeping, while still restraining rotation. So we would have the same angle here uh, on the right side of the beam as we do on the left side. So the angle is restrained, but we can still have a, a vertical displacement as shown here. The procedure for drawing influence lines can be broken down into the following steps. First, we can release this constraint to the reaction shear a moment for which you are drawing an influence line. For statically determinant structures, this step is going to yield a, an unstable structure. So the modified structure will be unstable after you release the constraint. Next, we can apply the release constraint back to the structure as a force. So here, if we're looking for reaction, we release the vertical restraint and we add a vertical force. If we're looking for our shear, we add our, our sticky roller. So we release the, the vertical or the shear restraint and then add back our shear force. For a moment, we release the moment restraint. So add a hinge and then we add the moment back to the structure. Next, we can draw the deflected shape of the modified structure after we apply back the release constraint. And then finally, the magnitude of the influence line for a reaction is going to be 1.0 at the location of the released, uh, released reaction. The magnitude and the jump in the shear diagram is going to be 1.0 when released. And the magnitude of the rotation at the hinge, the total rotation is going to be 1.0. So we can use, then, use these to develop our, our influence lines as we will for this example. For the first part of this problem, we want to draw the influence line for the reaction at point A, so the vertical reaction at point A. To do this, we first are going to replace the pin with a vertical roller. So we're releasing the vertical restraint. Next, we're going to apply the release constraint back to the member, so displace it up. We still have a, a straight line for our beam. And the magnitude of the influence line at the reaction is going to be 1.0. So this is going to be our influence line for the reaction at A. Next, we're going to look for the 
uh, reaction at A under the two different loading configurations shown here, LC1, LC2. LC1 is uh, the reaction under a point load, uh, P equal to 20 kips. So we have our 20 kips applied at uh, a point six feet from the side. So we need to find the vertical component or the, the vertical distance at in our influence line at that location. Uh, this is just a triangle, so we can find it by going 10 feet minus 6 feet divided by 10 feet is going to be equal to 0 0.4. So that's the magnitude of our influence line at 6 feet from the left support. We can then take that 0.4 times our load, 20 kips, and we'll get a reaction here of 8 kips. So under our load configuration one, we'll have a reaction and the left support equal to eight kips. Next, we can look at our simply supported beam here with a distributed load going from a point, uh, the mid span, five feet over to the right support B there. So what we want to do here is we want to take or find the area of our influence line uh, where we have our applied load. So our area is going to be the area of a triangle. So one half base times height. So height and base, and we'll get an area here equal to 1.25 feet. And then the reaction is just going to be that area, 1.25 feet times the distributed load, 10. kips per foot. So you see our, our units are consistent there in kips and feet. So we'll get our reaction to be 12.5 kips. So this is the reaction in the left support from the, the distributed load shown in load configuration two. The next part of the problem, we're going to look at the shear at point C, a location L over three from the left support. And we still have a, our simply supported beam. To draw the influence line, the first thing that we'll need to do is release the shear constraint. So we're adding our sticky roller here. We're going to apply that shear back to the structure uh, with a positive sign convention shown here and deflect the, the structure. So again, we have the same angle at the left and the right side of our, our release restraint, but we're allowing for that vertical displacement. So the magnitude, the distance from peak to peak, the jump is equal to 1.0. So we can put that 1.0 in there. And we know we have the same slope. So from our, our geometry, we know that uh, the height of this is going to be one third. So the value there would be negative one third. And the height here from there to there is going to be two thirds. So first we can look at our load configuration three. And for our load configuration three, we have a distributed load from point C to point B. So to find the magnitude of the shear at point C from this distrib distributed load, we need to find the area of our influence line uh, diagram here, and then take that area times our distributed load W. So our area is just going to be, again, one half uh, base times height, so 0.5 times two thirds times 2L over three is going to give us a value here of 2L over nine. So that's the area. And then we'll take that times W. So 2L over nine times W is going to give us a, a value here of 2WL over nine. So that'll be our shear if we apply the distributed load from C over to B. So we can look at load configuration four then where we have our distributed load from A to C. And in this case, we're looking at the area here between A and C in our influence line diagram. And our area is then going to be 0 0.5 times negative one third times 
L over 3. So this is going to be uh, negative L over 18. We can take that times W to find our VC. And we're not concerned about the sign in our sh in shear, so we'll just do L over 18. times w, so wl over 18 is going to be our shear in this case. So we have our, our shear demand uh, due to load configuration 4 and our shear demand from load configuration 3. In the last part of the problem here, we're going to find the influence line uh, for the moment at C. Um, and then find the magnitude under the given load configuration. So for this, using the Mueller-Breslau principle, the first thing that we'll do is release the constraint, release the moment at C. So we add this hinge here at C, and then we apply the moment back. We deflect the shape, or draw the deflected shape under that applied moment with the released moment constraint. And then we uh, find the mag, or we add the magnitude. So the magnitude of this rotation is going to be equal to 1.0. So for our influence line, it'll be easier if we can figure out the height of the influence line diagram at point C. So to do this, we need to look at our geometry. So we know that alpha times A, so alpha times A, uh, which is approximately equal to the, the height, assuming small angles, is equal to beta times B. So those heights are equal. So we know that our, our beta is equal to, so alpha times A equals beta times B, so beta equals A over B times alpha. We also know that our total angle here is equal to alpha plus beta, and that's going to be equal to 1. So we can substitute in our, our beta and find that our alpha is going to be equal to B times L. So our A times alpha, or the height at this location at C, is going to be equal to A times B over L or AB over L. So this is our height at C, and we can use that then in our influence line diagram to calculate our moment under different loads. So we're going to look back at the load configuration 3, where we have a distributed load from point C to point B. And to find the moment caused by that distributed load, we'll need to take the area times the distributed load W. So the first thing that we can do is calculate the height of our influence line uh, diagram at point C. So this is going to be L over 3 times 2 L over 3 divided by L. This will be 2 L over 9. Our area then is going to be 0.5 times 2L over 9, times 2L over 3, uh, which will give us a value here of 2L squared over 27. Our moment then is just that area, 2L squared over 27, times the distributed load W, so this will be equal to 2w l squared over 27. So this is the moment then at point C caused by the dis distributed load between C and B. We can also use the Mueller-Breslau principles with continuous girders or uh, indet indeterminate structures. So when we have indeterminate structures, our influence lines are no longer going to be linear, but we can use these to help guide where we should place the loads to cause maximum or minimum force effects. So the, we would use the same principles. So at, as an example, here's a three-span continuous structure. And if we were looking at the reaction at support A, we would release the vertical constraint and displace the structure up. We know that if we displace that structure up, it's going to come down back to the uh, this support at B. It'll 
go under, come back to the support at C, and then up, and then back to the support at, at D. So we can use this then to figure out uh, where do we need to apply loads to maximize our reaction at A, or we could also uh, minimize the reaction and, and see you know, wh where we would want to place the, the deck to you know, minimize our, 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 reaction our reaction or you know, moment restraints. So we can do the same thing with our moment. Uh, we, if we're looking at the moment at point E, we would release the moment restraint at point E. So add a, add a hinge in here and then apply the moment back and then displace the structure. And then we can know where we can you know, apply loads to maximize or minimize the moment at E. So with that, that concludes this example.